Friday afternoon at the Manor. My name is John Joseph Massandrea, and it's a delight to have Julie here. But uh, we're going to bring over, bring the mic over to Susan Johnson. We will welcome uh, uh, Julie Malone to our wonderful uh, podium Friday afternoon at the Manor. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad you could make it. We're honored to uh, welcome Julie Malone, as JJ said, who is going to tell us about the Celtic Festival of Samhain. And I can't wait to hear about it. So Julie, please. Thank you very much, Susan. And that was beautifully uh, pronounced. And John, thank you for the uh, invitation. So um, as stated, my name is uh, Julie and I live in the southwest of Ireland and I have uh, lived here all my life and as have my forefathers. And the Celtic Festival of Sound starts in All Hallows Eve. So it's the 31st of October. And we have eight fire festivals on our Celtic Queen of the Year. And Samhain is our uh, Celtic New Year. So on all our feast days um, on the Celtic Queen of the Year, uh, we have the two solstices. We have the two equinoxes, which are the points of, of balance. Then we have Samhain, which would be known as Halloween. And that is the festival of death and rebirth. And then we go on to St. Bridget's Day, which is beginning of spring. And then we have Bialtana, which is the beginning of summer. And Lunasa, which is the beginning of Harvest Festival, which is, which is August. Yeah. I want to be yeah. unmuted. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about Somebody that. Going? That's Gary. He wants to figure out mute. Okay, I can help him along. Okay. <laughs> so Samhain is a really sacred, sacred festival in Ireland. And I think when it comes to all the festivals, at the point of the festival, I always say, this is my favourite festival. And when I am at that point of the year, it really is. And I think what that signifies to me is just that every festival and has a very different energy. And at that time of the year, it seems like the most sacred of them. Uh, but there's something very special in Samhain insofar as it's also our festival of the dead. So Samhain, is A-M-H-A-I-N, uh, is also the name in Irish of the whole month of November. And in Irish, we call it Ni Namarov, which is the month of the dead. And in our tradition, and as a child growing up in Dingle, um, I know you get to uh, celebrate Halloween, but we didn't really see it as Halloween. We saw it as sound. And Halloween has come from the Irish Festival of the Dead of Sound. So as children, it was very much uh, gathering around at home. So we didn't go trick-or-treating. We didn't go to other people's houses, uh, but we did dress up. The Irish name for spirits would be Pukki. So we dressed up as Pukki. And what we did usually, it consisted almost exclusively of um, pillow slips. And we would do the two eyes and the mouth and sheets and old clothes. And we would dress up basically as spirits and try and frighten each other. Run around the house, go visit the graveyard. Um, and then we use turnips. So turnips are Swedes, which are very different to uh, pumpkins because they're very hard to carve. So we'd be carving and spoons and uh, knives and forks and bending spoons. And there was five children in our house. So we might have like five or ten uh, pumpkins. And then we would make all the scary, sorry, of the turnips, we'd make all the scary faces and we would put them on the windows and they were really to scare away any malevolent uh, spirits or any spirits that may come unwelcomely to, into our house. And then there was also, we would make, do nice um, uh, turnips and they were to welcome the good spirits in, um, on the night. Uh, so we would sit around, we would have dinner. We would leave uh, an empty chair. We would leave an empty plate. So that when the spirits came to the, our home, they knew, because this was our sacred uh, festival of the dead, that they knew that we, they wel we welcomed them, that there was always a place for the ancestors to come. 
come back. Yeah. Always a place at our table. And we played a lot of games. And uh, to me uh, and to us at the time, they were just simple games, but retrospectively, they were all divination games. So we used to make this bread and we call it the boring brack. Uh, so it's known as the, 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 the barn brack. And in it, we'd get pieces of a grease, brown grease with paper and we put a ring and we put a pea and a stick and uh, a penny and a rag. So there was great excitement. The ring was like the most prized possession. And if you got the ring, it foretold that you would marry. And if you got the pea, it foretold that you would never marry. That was a complete devastation when you're six years old. <laughs> and then if you got the rag, it meant that you, were, you had poverty ahead of you. And if you got the stick, it meant your spouse was going to beat you or you were going to have a life of real hardship. Uh, so, <laughs> so there was, there was great uh, excitement and great, um, uh, you know, I suppose like, fighting over the, over, over the barn brack and who's to get the next slice. So my mother and father would have to really, you know, guard it as to who was to get the greatest slice because we always wanted the ring. Uh, but they're all divination games. So we used to play bopping apple and snap apple. And, you know, there was other other games that uh, foretold who was going to die first. Um, but it was always about our ancestors because we truly believed. And these were the rituals that we had. And it was normal to us. But retrospectively, they were very much, you know, rituals for the dead. We would leave some food outside the door um, uh, as an offering to the spirit world and the nature world. And we would sit around dinner and I know mom and dad used to say, you know, well, who died now since last year? And there'd be big discussions as to who died. And then we would speak of them and we would remember my, my grandparents and aunties or uncles or whoever had died. So we would start with who, who died within the, follow, the, the previous 12 months. And then we would move on to the outer spectrum. And I suppose, you know, when we always fear that when we die, we, we'll be forgotten and nobody will remember us. Uh, but an All Hallows Night and Iahauna, Iahauna, we, we remembered everybody. And... Uh, it's it's not as ritualistic as writing it down, even though I know for because uh, we all grew up Catholic in Ireland, and we would have the November uh, list of the dead. So you would write down all the the people that you needed to be remembered, and you would bring it to the church, and then that would be included in the book for the dead for for November. But I I loved that ceremony, and I still do it at home on Iha Hauna on on personally speaking of each one that died and remembering them and remember the good and, and, and the witty things uh, of them. Um, so it's, we also see it as the place of going from summer to winter. So it's entering the darkest part of the year. So from Samhain, six weeks later, we have winter solstice which is a sh the shortest day of the year and the darkest point of the year. So for those six weeks, and then six weeks after that would be Lolly Breeders in Bridget's Day, and six weeks after that would be the uh, spring equinox. So every six weeks we have our festival. But there are also pauses in working with the agricultural year. So there are pauses of all the work is done. This is our big harvest festival. Our tubbies are full, our larders are full, uh, any cattle that needed that weren't going to be carried over for the winter were slaughtered between Samhain and the 11th of November, which was St. Martin's Day. So that's when any cattle we weren't going to, call, to carry over, all debts were to be paid by the St. Martin's Day. So it was a time when we had uh, the last sheaf was cut from the, uh, from the ground. So anything to be harvested outside from the fields would, would, be, would be done by now. And anything after that would be left to the Chaylak, to the crone. 
to, you know, we don't have um, a history of witches in Ireland. Uh, what we had is um, one of our deities was the Chaylach, the crone, the hag. And anything left in the field after sound was left to the hag. Uh, so all, 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 all good was, was brought in before that. And it was a time of going into deep dreaming. It was a time of coming home to self. And Ihahauna was very much a liminal space of movement between the spirit worlds, that they could come visit us so we could go and visit them in this traveling, that there wasn't any time. This was a space where it was all as one. And when we dressed up as Puki, as spirits, if someone came to the door, you would offer them soul food and you would welcome them in. And of course, if you're very welcoming and, uh, you know, good fortune would be bestow you. And if you weren't so welcoming, obviously, the opposite of good fortune would be bestow you. <laughs> and it was also a time of trickery, you know, because when you're masked, I suppose the funny thing about when you're masked and we had our pillowcases or our old clothes and, um, you know, there was no face paints or anything like that. Um, it was, it was, you know, just, uh, just maybe soot would be used maybe or in, around the eyes. And um, I suppose every day uh, when, you know, it's like me coming talking to you tonight, I put my face on, put my lipstick on, put my game face on uh, all of you are here in your own game face way. So here we are in, in, you know, in ordinary life, yet how we react to different, in different places, how you at home or if you were in a court of law or if you were in church or if you were shopping, you know, there's different appropriate behavior. Whereas when you're wearing a mask, you can be at your truest. It's funny, you know, without the mask, we're masking all the time, but in Iha Hauna, there's a freedom. There's a freedom to, to be who you are because you're sheltered behind the, this mask. So I suppose, you know, um, uh, I know like uh, perhaps uh, people opening gates or throwing eggs or, you know, uh, there was a certain freedom on that night to maybe do a little trickery on someone that you had to suffer for the rest of the year. And uh, uh, there's a certain cleansing in that. Uh, we always, um, I lived just across the road from a graveyard. So we always went to the graveyard on Iahauna. And um, it was always very exciting to go to the graveyard. Uh, and we went inside the, the, the gates and we said our prayers. And then we used to run around the graveyard and go all the way up around and down. And it always seemed like a really exciting thing to do, uh, except that when you got to the very top, there was always a moment maybe where it was like, oh, I don't know, this is such a good idea. <laughs> and we would just terrify ourselves. Uh, but again, we were constantly um, looking out and waiting for communication with the other side. Um, and that when that that threshold time, very much a threshold time, uh, the summer winter threshold time, and in Ireland, you know, we have the fairies, the Dina Maha, that's the Irish for the good people, and it's not like Hollywood, uh, you know, when we say fairies and or the she, or we're talking about people like us, but they're much smaller and, and they, they, they're, they're from the old gods, the Thuidadhanan, uh, the Shi, they're in the, in the mounds, they're in the mountains, they're in the stones, they're the stone people, the standing people, they're, they're in the other world. And the Hawthorne tree was our portal to the, to the other world. It was very sacred. The hawthorn tree is very sacred. And the hawthorn tree is part of the rose family. And uh, it would be very much used for grieving or for anything to do with the heart, strengthening the heart, 
for blood pressure, for the cardiovascular system, uh, on emotion level for grief. Um, and the Hawthorne tree in Irish is called the Shkak Gal, which is the bright bush. And in May, which is six months after Samhain, uh, and that's the threshold of, of leaving uh, spring into summer, um, into the really bright part of the year, uh, the flowers of the hawthorn become the May blossom. And they're quite intoxicating uh, in, in the most beautiful way, the, the, the smell of the, of the hawthorn. But at this time of the year, we're talking about the halls of the, the hawthorn. So that would be a very sacred tree in Ireland, and you daren't cut it. And a lone hawthorn was a, um, it was a very lucky thing to have in, 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 on your farm or on your land, but you daren't uh, damage it, or you'd always ask permission before you harvested from it. So we would always say the she or the little people. So when I talk about fairies, and we're not talking about um, wings or anything like that. Really, we're talking about um, this other world that in Ireland, it's normal for us. We seem to be appeasing them all the time, you know, leaving milk and honey out for them and, you know, going to holy wells and blessing them and uh, asking for blessings from them. And uh, this is normal. Um, you know, roads uh, have been diverted in Ireland uh, because they couldn't cut down a, a hawthorn tree. Uh, a big dual carriageway had to be diverted. So three or four years of engineering work and plans had to be diverted because the local people wouldn't allow them to cut the hawthorn tree down because they felt it would be bad luck to those that travelled in the world. So it's a real, the harvest is in, we're moving into winter. And we, we, it was also seen that the fairies are moving from their summer residence, their winter residence. So there's the spirits and then there's this other world um, of, of beings. And uh, we had to be very careful. And when we talk about the other world, it brings into play, uh, question ourselves our own mortality. And where are we with this? And how will we die? And when will we die? And who will we die with? And who will be present? And, you know, these deeper questions of, of death. And even as children, you know, the games, uh, death came into it and it made it very present, but it also made it very normal. Uh, you know, so in, in Ireland, when somebody dies and the body is brought home, and I think my first memory of death was when I was seven. My grandmother was dying and we were in the house with her and we were having cups of tea. And you know, I wasn't having cups of tea, I was seven, but all the adults were. Uh, but I do remember being inside in the bedroom and, and her drawing her last breaths and, uh, and all the people around me, the adults, obviously they were taller, so I was smaller. And, but it was very normal and saying say goodbye to, to Nana. And the bodies are kept in the house. We, um, it's normal to touch them, to kiss them, to be present with them, to play music with them, uh, to celebrate their life, to, to be very conscious of the journey from their clay body to the other world. And especially in on and All Hallows Eve, we really, um, I suppose, we, we would light big bonfires. And fire is very transformational. Fire is very, a very uh, transformative element. And um, you know, we turn off all the lights and just have candles and we'd have the fire outside. And uh, it all comes back to our cultural year where uh, we would look on, you know, how kind that the sun has been to us in all our harvest is in. But now we must get through the winter. Now we must get through the deep dreaming. Now we must move through. It's, um, it's like going into the womb. So all in nature is letting go. The fall is there. It's a very beautiful transition. Uh, the fall in nature and all the colors of the trees they just let go. It's like a, 
and exhale. And that calls for us to exhale as well. It calls for us to relax. It calls for us to come fireside. It calls for us to gather closer as a family and to be. And I think when you turn off all the lights and when you just light a candle or you sit by fireside, it changes everything. It changes how we communicate with each other. It changes how we see each other. Uh, you know, there's a lot more shadows and light when, um, when you're fireside. And things are not as, we're not stuck in the uh, clarity, we're not stuck in the, I suppose, the, the enemy of clarity where things are fixed, you know, by a fire, things are a lot more gray and you're more open and more expansive. So we would, and the Irish of um, a bonfire is the tine chnova. Tine is a fire and chnova is bones. And uh, so in the bone fire, in this bone fire, and we would let go in the bone fire. We would, um, we would send our wishes to spirit in the bone fire. Uh, we would call to our ancestors through the fire. We would send blessings to them through the fire. And we would have that space, um, that liminal space would feel very real um, in the rituals by the fire. Um, and of course, harvest time so you know it's a it's a beautiful time of abundance and with that time of abundance comes uh gratitude we're so grateful we're so grateful that the grain is in we're so grateful that the animals have been fed we're so grateful that we have food to carry over we're so grateful for our health for our being for our families and there's also, I suppose, that time in winter where families are gathered closer. And, you know, families are complicated. <laughs> They're very complicated. <laughs> it's not so simple. So, you know, in the summertime, we're out and about. It's all about being outward. Whereas in wintertime, you have to come inwards. So you also... You know, you're more um, you're more aware of your inner landscape and working on your inner landscape, and you're in closer proximity to 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 your 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 family or your community. And uh, we have a word in Ireland called "bahan tiat." So "bahan tiat" was when people went from one house to the other. This is uh, pre-television or pre-digital. And they would play fiddle by the fire, or they would play cards, they would sing, they would tell stories. A shanaki is the Irish word for a storyteller. And this was normal. So winter time was a great time. And Iahauna, Halloween night, All Hallows Night, was the beginning of that. The beginning of, of that period of darkness where all the work was done in the fields. And their survival, uh, you know, was dependent on the few hours of um, of daylight where they just had to bring firewood in and water and do whatever they needed to do to tend to the land. But for the most part, the work was done. So there was a lot of creativity, a lot of music, a lot of dance and a lot of celebration and time, time just to be and time to communicate. And when we're working um, or when we when we have nonverbal communication with music and with movement and with stories uh, that links us again back to our ancestors, it links us back to speaking of the dead, remembering them, and a lot of these stories and a lot of the dances and the music are generational they were they were handed down from generation to generation in irish music and in irish dance uh, so again everything was linked back in our culture 
in our language, in our music, in our movement to our ancestors and to the present day. Um, so my, when the Irish then left and went to America, uh, they must have been delighted because they found pumpkins. They didn't have to carve turnips and, you know, have forks bending and spoons bending, trying to dig them out. They found pumpkins and then they just slit the top and then off they went and they made their jack-o'-lanterns. And jack-o'-lantern obviously is the story of the um, the guy, this Jack, that made a pact with the devil. And uh, they call cards, you know, the devil's prayer book. So he was playing cards with the devil. And he was given, um, uh, he was given a, a pack of cards called the Devil's Prayer Book. And from there on, he won, he won with, with, with his um, deck of cards. And the pact was that the devil wouldn't take his soul. But when Jack died, he couldn't get into heaven and he couldn't get into hell. And he was given... He was given a coal to light his lantern, and there he travelled between the worlds forevermore, neither in heaven nor hell. He travelled with his lantern. So when the Irish went to America and they had their pumpkins, and I don't know, things went a bit crazy, and trick or treats happened, and Hollywood kicked in, and they started wearing fairy dresses, and I don't know. Screen and Halloween one and Halloween two happened and films happened and Hollywood happened and I don't know candy happened and <laughs> and the boring brack was out the door and the snap apples were out the door and the dead were out the door and everything was out the door except zombies. <laughs> so that is, but that is, you know, children see it through a very different eyes now. They see it through pumpkins and um, they see it through zombies and Descendants 2 and all the other movies that are gathered um, around Halloween. But for us, it's always the sacredness of gathering and honouring our dead, our ancestors. And taking time also into our own our own death and i think this is a really important thing that we speak of death and 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 speak of death to our family and to our friends and when we do it it's not that it draws us it draws it towards us but it it cuts the fears you know in speaking of it and being very present in wakes and very present in funerals um i think it uh, it takes away lots of layers of fear that otherwise they're there and they're just shoved in a corner and we won't speak of them. But the day the day will come, that transition, that journey, that 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 traveling into the great mystery. And um, Halloween is a wonderful time to 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 speak and to introduce um, uh, and to speak out loud. Uh, you know uh, your connection with death and. I think in doing that, in doing that, it makes life more precious. My feeling is that, you know, when I wake up in the morning and when I work with people that are dying or work with the families of people that are dying and helping them to transition and in, in letting go, we can't stop the death. We can't stop it. We can't run from it. And we can't stop it. But when we're really conscious when we're really conscious with those that are dying and when we give them permission to die, it's such a beautiful, potent energy. And I love that the last breath is another breath into another world. You know, it's the exhale, is the inhale. I always think that it's like going underwater just you know hold your breath and then you come up and you 
you exhale in the in in, in inhale in the next world and they're very close to us and at Ihauna there's that feeling of um of them just being present uh, and being conscious to that and that connection. Do you want to ask me anything, John? <laughs> That was amazing. One second. I just, I just, just, <laughs> just going to move you into what happened there. Ooh. I did a funny thing and I made you in the middle. I'm not sure what I did there. Okay. okay. I'm trying to. Oh, here we are. Gallery. It's good. Now we got everybody in gallery. Oh, yes. A few questions, definitely. You mentioned a couple of things, and I'm just thinking out loud. You mentioned a brack bread. Now, is that like a, a tea, the bread that's made with tea? No, no, it's not. It, it, there's, there's two. There's a tea brac, right. and then there's the bo the boring brac, which is the barn brac. The barn okay. brac is like a bread, but loads of currants and loads of raisins. Okay. But my mother was forever on the scout looking for a moist tea brac. She was obsessed right. with this. And every Halloween, we used to have another version of the moist tea brac that right. had different degrees of success and unsuccess. So I'm going so to ask. Born Brecht. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if anyone else wants to make a question. So, did uh, Gerald or Susan want to ask a question? Yeah, I'd like to. I mean, it's interesting okay. how um, all these. I mean, a lot of it comes from the Catholic. The the Day of the Dead is always around November first, whereas yes. in Japan, the Buddhist festival of Obon is in the summertime in in August. And that's the time when people travel back to their hometown to, you know, uh, again, with communicate with the, their family that's passed on before and that. So it's a, an interesting thing that how every culture seems to have its own version of this. In the, in the Celtic tradition, the Irish tradition, any festival starts in the darkness. Mm -hmm. So it always starts on the eve, the night before. So... Mm -hmm. And that's why our Celtic New Year is in Halloween, because ah. it's like it's like in the womb. Mm -hmm. So life starts in the womb and then there's the birthing and the moving forward and the manifestation. So uh, that's why it's on sundown that, the, that, that it starts. Right. Thank you. And I think Gary uh, Coates had a question. Uh, yeah, my background is Irish. My great grandmother came from Belfast, and my okay. uh, father's father came from Belfast. Two years ago, my partner and I went to Ireland, and oh. we were in Dublin, and we went down to Gorey, and we stayed mm -hmm. at a seaside village just outside of Gorey on the sea. Lovely. It was fabulous. Um, mm. I, I just don't understand the stories that you've told me. The only one that I heard before was the turnip being carved for uh, the festival. And I couldn't figure out how they ever carved a turnip, but now I With understand. With great difficulty. Yes. With bent great difficulty. Spoons, <laughs> bent forks. Many bent spoons, bent yeah. forks, <laughs> knives flying. <laughs> <laughs> fighting oh over goodness. a spoon, fighting over the best spoon that didn't bend. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I do know yeah, there so was another one, New Year's Eve here, which is our New Year's Eve. The darkest mm -hmm. person in the house was sent outside and to come in first to bring good luck. Does that have any okay. resonance with you? Yeah, I don't, no, and I was no. always sent out because I was the darkest okay. one in the family. Yeah. But it's, Is that the darkest uh, hair? Yeah, it was dark, very dark hair. Apparently, uh, what did they call them? The black Irish or something. I don't know what it is. A, a lot of mm -hmm. tales. But this, the uh, episode of you with your Nana, I was the same. I was nine years old, getting ready to go to school. And my mom was keeping my her mother at our house. This is the days before nursing homes, etc. Yes. And she'd had heart failure. And one morning, my mom called me, bring in a glass of cold water for Graham. So when I, just as I went in, my mom had my Graham sitting up and she was holding her at the back. And just as I come in with the glass of water, that was it. 
my grandmother just fell back. So when I come home for lunch, of course, I was told that Graham had passed away. And that was she, my first she, episode with death, nine years old. And then I, I had three women in my life who I was with when they passed away. The first was my mm. grand, the second was my mother-in-law at the hospital. And the last, of course, was my late wife. And the, the, the ironic thing about the passing of my wife, I was sitting beside her and she was in the bed in the hospital. And it was the doctor that told me, Eva's no longer with us. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, I, well, I'm sure she's still sleeping. Of course, you try and rationalize, but uh, yeah. very peaceful. So all with the exception of my mother-in-law, the deaths were very peaceful. The horrible thing about the death of my mother-in-law, uh, she had heart problems. We got her to the hospital, to emergency, and they attempted to insert an external pacemaker. And we were there when they were doing it. It was a horrible situation. And after she had passed away, the doctor came to us and said, well, we tried to do everything. I said, why didn't you just let her go? It was just horrible. However, I'm that's sorry. all part of it. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, Gary, you know, and uh, um, death is, as, as has birth, both have become very medicalized, except mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of the um, medical institutions unfortunately view death as um, a failure. Mm. And, yeah. you know, she, she lost her life to, to cancer, mm -hmm. you know, or she, you know, she, it, it, it's almost like the terms are in like a, a failure or if the person had done something wrong. Um, yes. So it sounds like you have been a great companion to be with in the death process uh, because it sounds like they all took their breath into the next life in very peacefully. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I turned 80 this year and uh, like everybody else who's 80, there's certain health issues. So I'm, I tell everybody I'm playing the waiting game now. So they look at me and I said, what's that? I said, I'm waiting to die. Is there anything wrong with that? We're all going to go. <laughs> My uncle, as he got older, he, uh, he, towards the end, he's sick. I'm actually in the waiting room now. <laughs> <laughs> they're go oh, they're going to see me next. I'm in the yes. waiting room. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's great. I, I enjoyed your, your uh, I can't say stories, your history of Ireland. And uh, the one thing I wanted to ask, where did the, the fairy phenomena come from? How was it started? Is there any, any logical explanation to this? Is it folktale or? It's folktale. So, you know, we have the two of the which are like a, a mythical uh, race in Ireland. And uh, there was the Fomorians and, you know, the Miletians came and fought them. And uh, then uh, through all the wars, um, it was decided that we would live above ground and they would move underground. Oh. Mm -hmm. So they are our fairy folk. They live underground. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit like I... Um, I talking about sound and how it's our sacred festival of the dead. And then there's this mad occasion of Halloween that, you know, is more Hollywood. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Hollywood is so, like, you know, Halloween is so far from the sacred sound. Mm -hmm. So our fairies are our mythical deities in Ireland and what we call the good folk, the we folk, um, the good people, they're very much the old gods to us. They're very much the old gods. And Ireland, Ireland is a, it's, it's a very magical place and the land is very magical. And that's what I work with. I work with the land all the time. So I work as a Dingle Druid. So it's, it's with the land and with the plants and with the trees and with the agricultural year. It's what I work with. It's who I am. I, I was I grew up a, a farmer's daughter, so I I I just see the world through through that prism. I see the world in 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 working with nature and working in the agricultural year. Um, but Ireland is covered with uh, 
fairy mounds, stone circles. Uh, you know, it's just everywhere. There's mm-hmm. sacred sites everywhere. And it's in the land. Uh, it's a very tangible thing, the sacredness of the land here. And That's, Julie, can you say even, more about the hawthorn bushes? And, and yes, I remember when we were yes. in Carlingford, there was a, a we, we always looked out for the fairy rings, meaning that sometimes mm-hmm. it'd be a circle of bushes. And they said, you, you should never cross into it unless you ask permission. Yeah, so the hawthorn is a, it's it's in the genus of the rose family, right, right. and it's a re, it's a really good um, remedy. For, so herbalists use it all the time for your right. heart, and uh, so physically it's very good for your heart, blood pressure, any balancing of the heart on a physical level and an emotional level. It's really good for um, um, grief or any emotional upset. And when I say grief, you know, grief is the loss of many things. You know, it's, it's the loss of many things. Because uh, sometimes people just say, you know, think of it in terms of uh, a loved one. But, but you know, we're, we're constantly grieving and shedding every day over many things. But the hawthorn is just sacred. It is sacred. Um, I was mentioning earlier that there was a, a three or four or five years of engineering uh, in County Clare in building um, uh, a dual carriageway. And when they came to physically build the dual carriageway, the local people gathered around and said, you're not going to cut down that hot thorn tree. You're not cutting it down. <laughs> so you have all these people in the hard hats, you know, you've got the, <laughs> you've got all the logical team going, listen, we're driving a road through here and that's it. You know, we're, we're four or five years down the plans. We've got the money. You know, you know it's a big thing doing a, doing a highway or a, a, um, a motorway. And no, they said no. If that lone hawthorn tree is cut down, because we view it as very sacred, you don't touch it, right. and it is a portal to the other world. It is the portal to the she. It is a portal to the Dina Maha, to the good people, to the fairies. So, to the old gods. So you do not cut it. So, people power worked, and they had to divert the road. They had to- had to go and all the engineers and all the work, you know, they had to go make another plan and divert it around this hawthorn tree. That, so that is how sacred. And it's a funny thing in Ireland, you know, because even, you know, people say, well, sure, I don't believe in any of that rubbish. I don't believe in any of that rubbish. And then if you ask them to cut down a hawthorn tree, they say, not at all. Are you mad? I'm like, why? But you don't believe in that rubbish. But you would be mad to want to do it. <laughs> okay. So even those that claim not to believe in it still wouldn't touch it for yeah. fear of, for fear of. And it's just in our bones. Yes. It's just, it's of us, you know. It's very difficult to describe that. And um, Gary, you've been to Ireland and John, and you've been to Ireland. It's an of course, not a debate, <laughs> right? Sorry? It's an of course, not a debate. <laughs> Right. Bit, yes, it just it is it, it it is how it is, and um, and we've all grown up with that sacredness. But uh, you know, the but, I mean, the, the oak tree is sacred to us, and it's very much about strength. And the blackthorn is sacred. All the plants, the holly is sacred. Blackthorn is what we make the shillelaghs and the the the, the blackthorn stick from. Okay. And uh, but the elder and the hawthorn. They're the two that we have to be very, very careful with. Right. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, in um, uh, I suppose in people would be very wary of the hawthorn, and there would be a lot of folklore beliefs around the hawthorn, and the folklore beliefs would be, leave it alone, don't touch it. It's you know, it's it's not of this world. It's belonging to the other world. So we don't touch it. What and part of the hawthorn, you know? What part of the hawthorn is used for the heart and blood pressure? Um, the halls are used, and the and the flowers are used. So I make a hawthorn brandy every year, um, and so you just get uh, you pick your halls and you wash them, you bring them in, you uh, put them in a bottle or a kilner uh, jar. I uh, put maybe a spoon of sugar in, fill it with brandy, and then give it a little shake um, mm-hmm. every day for um, 
for a couple of months and then you open it up, strain it off. And then I would use that in a, a little dropper bottle. So when I say hawthorn brandy now, it's not something you sit down and you start, you know, kicking into a bottle of hawthorn brandy. Mm-hmm. You use this in medicine. <laughs> it's a medicine. So even a, um, a little dropper bottle, and if you're having a glass of water, you can put a couple of drops in, and it just eases the heart. So either way, people take a rescue remedy. So I would use a hawthorn uh, brandy like a remedy like that. And if somebody got a shock or if someone was in, in grief, I would um, I have tiny little crystal glasses and then I would pour them a small glass and ask them to sip it and it would warm the heart, it would ease the heart and it would just settle, settle the person down. So is it the brandy, is it the hawthorn, who knows? Is well, there, are any of these available in the health food stores? Um, you can buy haws. You, you know, you can pick haws at the moment, um, and you can buy them dried, and you could you could make your own brandy. Um, they can be sold as tinctures. So tincture mm-hmm. is the word that we use in making, uh, uh, you know, uh, a tincture. I call them um, spirit medicine. So I would have uh, tinctures of all kinds, um, and I suppose that's you know alcohol was uh, was made from plants you know so mm-hmm. i would have a rose and a mint vodka that i would do during the summer and it's really nice as an aperitif it helps to settle mm-hmm. and the mint uh, the slows which is the black thorn uh, that is something those thorns you have to be very careful when you're picking slows because you can get sepsis from the the thorns and all plants and trees that have thorns they're very protective but they also give us that quality of protection mm. and um it's very it's like in the cherry family so the the the, the slow gin slow gin is made and uh, it's uh, it's very it's really delicious but it's very uplifting it's very uh, brings a lot of light whereas the hawthorn brandy you know, really settles you. And um, we, we say that the, the slow berries and the black thorn, it pierces true with, with, with these very thorns, these very vicious thorns or protective thorns. It can pierce through that which we cannot pierce through ourselves. So, we, you know, so uh, people had all kinds of... Uh, um, you know, concoctions in their in their houses. So when somebody came to visit, you know, if you if you're feeling down, they might give you some of the blackthorn um, gin, and you know, if you were grieving, they give you a little bit of hawthorn, uh, and it was very normal. You know, mm-hmm. these are very normal, and um, I find that they're very potent. So you drink a tiny amount. And you get a huge relief from the plants, um, but it's 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 different to going in and buying something. Mm-hmm. Thank yes. you, Julie. This has been so amazing, and so we can't wait to uh, share this with other people, and probably we'll look forward to having you again this springtime. And we're looking forward to well, one day again returning to Ireland, and definitely. So, thank you. So, Susan, if you want to just, we'll pass our microphone over to Susan. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, this was really incredible. You can also catch us on YouTube um, and on our uh, webpage, manorroadunited.com, I think. And coming up next week, we have Marlena Smith, who's a theatre producer, who was there when the musical Cats was brought to Toronto. I don't know if any of you remember, but they were restoring the Elgin and Winter Garden Theatre for it. So this uh, sounds like it's going to be amazing. We hope you can make it. Thank you, everybody. Take care. It was really, really fascinating. So interesting.